Welcome to the Tea with Tamara podcast. I'm Tamara Arnold. And it wasn't that long ago that I was a broke single mom drinking way too much, completely detached from everything. Now I've written multiple books, downloaded I Could Read Chakras, and I'm a channel for the universe. I'm a real person with real stories, and I can't wait to share them with you. So grab a warm bevy and let's have some enlightened conversation to live our best life. Stop the presses, everybody. I am beyond excited because today on Tea with Tamara, I get to have a really sincere, honest, deep conversation with my mentor, my friend, one of the most incredible people I have met this turn of the earth in this human body. Today it is Tea with Tamara and Amber Lillystrom. Seriously, grab something, get yourself in a comfortable position, grab a blanket and a notepad because there is so much information, you guys, in today's episode that is going to blow your mind. And we do share near the end something that Amber's been doing every New Year's and I am going to be doing it this New Year's myself. So make sure you tune in right to the end to hear this incredible thing that we are doing. Oh my goodness, magical beings. I have been waiting a long time, about a month since I started my podcast. <laughs> this interview I have with me today, my mentor, my friend, someone who I hold very dear to my heart chakra, Ms. Amber Lillystrom is in the house. Yay. So excited <laughs> to delve deep in and to share your story. And if you'd like to say hey to everybody, we can start with that. Yes. Hi, guys. I'm so excited to be here, Tamara. Thank you, my love. I'm just, I'm so excited to just go where we're going to be taken today on this magical unicorn ride. Well, and it's pretty powerful because um, even as uh, we're sitting here, both Amber and I can tune into the universe pretty strongly. And so um, just being in this space about to do this interview, I can feel it all just coming in, flowing into both of us. And that connected state of you and I together just kind of amplifies it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm very very excited. So um, just in case any of my listeners haven't heard of you from me somehow, um, do you want to give a little bit of the Amber Lillystrom story to them? Yeah, sure. So uh, let's see where we want to be taken today. So um, I'm a wife and a mom. And I am someone who is always learning more about who she actually is and being reminded of that constantly in this human experience that I get to have here. Uh, I, for the work that I do, so the way that I get to serve and connect deeply with others is through uh, brand strategy, business coaching, but it's a whole lot more than that, <laughs> as you might guess. Um, and it's really about delving into truth and to reminding my clients of who they actually are and and not giving them permission but empowering them to give themselves permission to walk the path that is most aligned with that deep truth with what they're supposed to be doing here so they can learn their lessons so that they can expand beyond the limitations that uh, really come with the package deal of being a human and allowing us to tap into that that eternal infinite part of us that is always present so that's what i do in my work we pray (laughs) powerful um but were you always like this was this just something that was an innately amber lilies from quality or is this something that came about through you know experience in life Mm. you know um when I think back to my little version of me, that specifically the five-year-old version of me, um, she knew, but there wasn't the support around her to use that kind of language or to even explore into that. And so it was just something I kind of kept for myself. Um, <clears throat> and as I got older, I, I thought about, well, I might be a little bit crazy, but those experiences really did happen. And I did sit in my bedroom playing with my Barbies and all of a sudden feel like I could see the whole universe and, and heard a voice talking to me. Uh, okay, that's normal, you know, but that is real. And that, that was my childhood. And, and so I think there was just so much magic um, in my childhood. There's also a lot of 
trauma um, at the beginning of my, so my earliest, earliest memory um, is being sexually molested. And after that, um, I then went to court and testified against my abuser. But again, you know, even that there wasn't for me, it, I didn't see it as a trauma and a tragedy. It was just like what happened on my life path. And it gave me this invitation and this gift to delve into the deeper parts of myself. And when I think back to the five-year-old version of me and just how my life was and the stories that, that my parents tell me, I think that having a five-year-old now, uh, I don't have any idea how I did that, you know, and I look back, but it was always just who I was, you know, I always had this deep empathy and this ability to connect to the hearts of others, to understand how they were feeling. I remember sitting in these courtrooms and looking up at these big people and just thinking about how sad they looked or how angry they looked or how like hard their life must be. And, um, I just had this like wild empathy as a kid all the way through. And so that, that definitely has been with me all the days of my life. Um, after the testifying against my abuser, um, you know, my mom and dad did everything they could to try to help me have a normal life and to, you know, obviously I was in therapy and stuff to get the support, but it, you know, so much changed, you know, my, my parents were, my mom sold her business. She was an entrepreneur as well. And she sold her business, which was her dream because of what happened, you know? And so she couldn't have me not be with someone else. You know, she came home and from her job and she gave up her whole business, which was her dream. And I kind of saw, you know, the, the sort of shadow side of that, of what that looks like, you know, and, and the guilt and the shame that my mom carried with her for really all of my life because she still has it. And I think I vowed to myself at that young age that I wasn't going to live my life, uh, not, dealing with the stuff that was here and not moving past it and, and, um, living essentially in the past, you know? And so that was sort of like a little vow I made to myself. So I went on and I, um, I was a soccer player and I became a division one soccer player and I got a scholarship and all that, which was a goal that I set for myself when I was like nine, because I knew my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. And so I just like put that on my own back. And I was like, well, this is how you go to college. My dad had been a college athlete. So I saw, I thought that was the way that you'd go. And <laughs> so I just did that. And thank God, cause soccer was such, it was my first love. It was my, my therapy, my healing. Um, with it also came the invitation for me to really get self-critical and, you know, I'm a three on the Enneagram. Um, and I am, I'm, so I'm an achiever, you know, that's just like an innate kind of thing. And when I look back over the story of my life, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm an achiever. You know, like it's just, it's, and, and I was so praised for it as a kid. And I was given really became this transactional thing of like, do things really well and get a lot of praise and love. And so I was like, great. Okay. Well, that's a good equation. I'm just going to keep sticking the landing and I'm just going to keep pushing myself to do things because I love the feeling of, of that, um, of the pursuit and the working to get there and all that. And uh, so I did. And so I got that scholarship a year after I graduated or like months after I graduated from college, I began my career as a collegiate athletic marketing administrator. So um, I, again, worked through those 10 years of that career, every two years being promoted, uh, learning so many things, which I apply in everything that I do in my profession now from event planning, management, fan experience, mentorship. I taught at the university. So all of these things perfectly aligned to lead me to the profession that I'm doing today. Um, and then really the big catalyst, I mean, there's many, many things along the, the path of dipping in and out and realizing, you know, this, uh, this isn't really for me. I'm, I'm plugged into someone else's achievement system, but I'm afraid. I'm a pleaser. I'm, I, I know that if I do things well in the way other people want me to, then, then I'll get the result that I want, which is their love because I wasn't good at giving myself my own love. I didn't really know how. Um, that was like a, it felt like that was a, a chip in my hard drive that was missing. Like I came out of the factory and the self-love chip was just not even there, you know, uh, or at least not in the way that I really wanted it to work. <laughs> it was just like malfunctioning. And so, you know, I had an eating disorder through most of that time. I had about a 15 year eating disorder, which is just code for, you know, I need to control things and uh, I'm just going to use my, my body. So I would over-exercise and I would restrict food. Um, and that, you know, that was just, it was truly just like any kind of addiction. It was just a mechanism to try to help me feel safe and have control. And that was it. And food and, and exercise were my methods, you know, of choice. So, so I'm going to backtrack for a second. Yeah. That yeah. A whole lot of ammo. That was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> was like a lot. So first and foremost, I just want to like 
say I loved Barbies as a kid too. Like that was my favorite way to spend time. I <laughs> I was like 12 or 13, sidebar. Yeah, I think I did too. I totally did. I loved it. Right? Like in, in, in yeah. the coaching world, in, like what we do, it's kind of the same thing. We take people and we create help like create the life just like we did with our Barbies. Yeah, right. And I had the dream house and the whole thing. And, and now guess what? I live in my dream house. <laughs> right. So fun. The other part of this that I want to honor, um, because it's what I heard is that now we're talking young when you were abused, like five, six, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, like, like three, four. Um, okay. but then the, the testifying, and this is part of the weird part to is that, you know, I remember standing in like some sort of official office. I think it was that my mom said it was the attorney general and they were saying out loud and I could hear them. She's not going to remember. She's not, she's forgetting. She's not going to remember. And I, and I remember that being a foundational theme in my life of other people telling me what my truth was and speaking on my behalf. And so that began at the youngest possible age. And I remember feeling shame about it because they were basically trying to take it away. My abuser said the same thing. They won't believe you. No one will believe you. And I remembered everything. And I told that story for the last time when I was five years old. And I vowed to myself that I was going to tell the story the last time in front of that courtroom. And then I was out. I was done. Like right. that, that chapter was closed in my life and onward I went. So yeah. So that that's an important theme, I think. And it's also a consistent one that many women that I, that I work with and speak to ha have had happen in their lives uh, in different contexts, but that their truth is diminished and dismissed. And we learn to do that. We learn that theme. We learn that practice throughout our lives. And that's why we're in the wrong marriages. We, we, we our bodies are, seem like they're at war with us because we are, we are torturing them. You know, we are using them to try to cope with how we feel. You know, we're, it's why we say yes to the wrong jobs. It's why we take so long to actually do the things we want for our lives. I'm going to give kudos to your parents here for um, listening to you. They did. And mm -hmm. My know, mom did. My dad at first actually point. didn't, but my mom fought for me. And yeah. That's really like I, as a mom, you know. Like, yes. That's a really powerful thing to give to your child of that age is their voice. Yes. And so I just wanted pause here and just yeah. acknowledge that and now we're going to cry and <laughs> yeah path. but you know what she also taught me through that Tamara and thank you for saying it with those words that you just used um she taught me how to have courage you know she taught me what that virtue actually means at such a young age so I've always had it and it's why I can do hard things and I just I, and I don't know how but I just do it because I remember saying to myself in that hallway, I was five years old, my parents couldn't come into the room with me when I had to testify. And I remember saying, have courage, Amber, have courage. It was five and I already knew how to do that. And so I am so grateful for that because she didn't have to, she, she could have just thought I was drawing weird pictures and dismissed it instead of asking me what was, what was actually happening here. And she went, and she also then became an advocate. And it was like the hardest thing for her in her entire life because she just kept having these experiences happening with this girl that we were nannying. And it, she found out that she was being abused by her dad. And my mom had to confront her mother to say, cause the mother didn't want to listen. And my mom helped save her. My mom saved all these kids because of what happened to me. Like she had the awareness. So yeah, it's profound. And I am the, the person I am for, because of my mom in so many ways. When I see it reflected in the things that you share on your Instagram and how powerfully you stand behind women's rights and, and you know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's really translated into such a powerful platform for you to yeah. be able to honor so many other women and their voices. And Thank you. so I found that profoundly beautiful. Thank you. And so <laughs> yeah. From here, I just want to acknowledge as well and, and kind of go into this because I know I have listeners who have suffered from control issues as well. And, um, you know, we've talked about this as being, you know, the masculine feminine balance and like, mm -hmm. you know, even getting into the go, 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 drive, drive, drive. 15 years is a long time. Sidebar. It's a long time. Yeah, it was, a, it was a long time. And there was a lot of um, other work that needed to be done just for my body on the other side, just healing, you know, but most of all, um, it was the only way I knew how to live. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, 
I would wake up in the morning and my feet would hit the floor and the tape would start playing of, of how much I essentially despise myself. I mean, truly the shame that I felt. And I, through my achievement was where I found any sort of valuation of me. Um, and I was able to get to the point where I realized that that wasn't normal nor healthy nor good. <laughs> and, uh, and it was the thing I wanted to change the most, but I, it was like, you know, those times when you have like 11, 11, or you find a penny and you make a wish. The wish that I would always make was I wish that I could just love myself. I wish I just like, could like make it magical wand myself and just make myself like appreciate and respect me. And it doesn't work that way, uh, unfortunately, because it takes, it takes work. And I, w- the, the doorway for me to commit to that work was one, being ready, but two, knowing that I was going to be the mom to a little girl. Now, I wasn't even pregnant yet, but I knew my whole life, even when I was that little five-year-old, that one day I would have a little girl and somehow I was going to make it different. I don't know. I just, I just knew it my whole life. That like she wasn't going to have to go through what I went through and, and I went through it. And so that I could protect her. I don't know. It was just a story as a kid that I already kind of had this narrative in my, for my life. Well, you are tuned in. Right? Yeah. So like there was yeah. a knowing deep within you. Yeah. Of, of this stuff. But mm-hmm. I'm just trying to place the times like, cause 15 years, was it like when you were. So, in- so I was 15 years, 15 years old when the eating disorder started and I was 30 when I committed to doing my work. That was when I decided I went to go see a therapist, but it wasn't just therapists. It was a psychologist who worked with people who had eating disorders. And I felt, you know, like, well, I don't look like someone who has an eating disorder. Uh, I don't, you know, I didn't, I was, I was also doing competitive fitness at this point because this was like the, the way to hide it, you know? Okay. Well, if I, they're going to show me the exact way to get small, right. To, 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 to shrink essentially. Um, and also still be really athletic. Cause I like that too, you know? So it was like the perfect little place to go and hide. And, um, and it was, it just didn't work. I was miserable. I remember standing backstage at one of the shows after going through months of working out multiple times a day, you know, cutting down on food, cutting back on water, the whole thing, the whole like rigmarole that goes with becoming a competitive fitness athlete, all tanned up, all sparkly looking like, you know, like a glowing Barbie doll, honestly. And I'm standing backstage thinking, I am the fattest girl here. And I, and I literally, it's like, I'm having these two experiences. I'm having this, this conscious experience of really feeling like that's true. And then this other experience of like, Amber, this isn't okay. Like the, you, this, you know, deep down, this isn't true, but I know you think it. And this is really what, where dysmorphia comes in. Mm-hmm. We got to get some help. We got to get some help. And thank God the wiser part of me was, was awake and there to help me. And um, I started working with her. And I remember when she said, you have an eating disorder, you know, like she basically like gave me a diagnosis and, you know, again, the wiser part of me was like, cool, I like your labels, but I'm not really going to subscribe to that. But then the other part of me was like, she's not wrong. You know, I, I mean, I would open the refrigerator and I would cry because I didn't know what to eat. I didn't know how to eat. It would, it would just, it was so stressful. And, um, and just like getting dressed was such a stressful act for me because like things would be too big or they would be too small. And I couldn't, I just couldn't find the right balance, you know, in any of it. And I was just so uncomfortable. And so we committed to doing the work and, you know, it was a rugged road. There were days where I, and I've, you've heard me tell this story before. I had to literally tell myself, and this is where my internal mental talk is so powerful. I would say before I would wake up and immediately the first thought would be like, I would pinch my stomach or I would say something mean to myself. And then I would say, nope, we're not doing that today. So you can either go into the closet and I would, had already picked my clothes out the night before. I'd already packed my food the night before to, to support myself because I knew this would cause stress for me. So the outfit's in the closet and, and I would, there's a mirror that I would walk by in my bedroom, which now I don't have mirrors in my bedroom because feng shui, you don't have mirrors in your bedroom, which is a great thing. And, <laughs> and I was like, you can't look in the mirror. If you're not going to be kind to yourself, then you're not allowed to use a mirror and you're going to have to get ready without a mirror today. So good luck with that. And let's be, let's, let's like do the work through it. And I just had to be really kind of direct with myself through those weeks and months of unraveling this thing. And, um, ultimately now it's, it's not a thing. Um, it's not a thing. And it's, it's such a, it's such a blessing because that was a profound commitment and, and, you know, 
body of work that needed to happen because it was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me. It was, it was people I grew up with. And then the places where I plugged myself into and being on a division one soccer team and having a coach suggest to you like, Oh, well, maybe we should go on some like lean cuisine meals or something because your agility is down and, and making comments about my body. And I already was crushing myself about it. So then getting anyone else's feedback on it just took it to a whole nother level. Right. in that solar plexus. It went. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. I have to tell you, cause I'm a creepy creeper some. So I totally scrolled your <laughs> Instagram feed one day. Like, right oh, you went like all the way. Very beginning. Like I did. <laughs> Guys, it's like I've always said that I'm creepy on Instagram. So for friends, watch out. Um, and so I saw your picture of doing the show. Yeah, there's one in there. Yeah, and I honestly had to do a double take because I, I didn't recognize you as I know. the Amber that is today. It's like there was a dullness compared to yeah, like yeah, the way that you like glowed. yeah, because it was like I knew I had I knew about my gifts. I knew about you know the ways that I helped people. I had been doing it all along in different ways. That's why I was the captain of the soccer team. It was why I was teaching and mentoring students. And my colleagues would come and sit in my office and want to just like have me coach them. You know, it was that was always there. But the my my internal struggle, that war I was waging on myself, was just taking my life force away. And and it was just such a smoke screen, you know, and so much just chaos that kept me from my deepest connection with, with source and with spirit. And then also, because you can't, you can't do it. You know, you can't bypass that part, the relationship with yourself. It's the conduit to connecting to spirit. And I was trying to bypass it. I used to hate the quote. I had, I use this lunch bag I bring my little meals. Everything was always prepared, bring it into the lunchroom, get my stuff heated up. And the bag would sit on the counter while I was waiting for my food to heat up. And it would say um, something to the effect of, you, you can't love anyone else unless you love yourself, that quote. And I, would, I, would, I hated it. I hated that quote. And I was like, no, I'm, not, I, I'm somehow exempt from that. Like that, that version of me wanted to be exempt from that. And, and what, a, like, what a blessing, you know, that, that now um, I give myself all the love and I give myself all the breaks and there'll be times when, you know, if I'm out of alignment or not really being consistent with my practice or, you know, having people in my house 24 hours a day for the last six months, because <laughs> I'm building an addition where I can feel just like the edges of it come back a little bit, just like the edge, not the food part, but just the little bit of the worthiness conversation. And it's, and that's a great reminder. It's a great recalibration tool that I don't want to have to have. But I'm, you know, I'm a work in progress, just like all of us, you know, and, and this is a conversation that I'm having with my clients all the time, because many of my clients struggle with the same things that I did. It's how the former versions of us tend to be the people that we serve. So, so it's, it's beautiful practice because it helps me to really augment what I've learned in the work that I've done and to continue to strengthen those muscles. And so I want to, for those who are listening right now, um, I want to bring attention to like, you were busy. Yeah. Yeah. You live yeah. like, even the way that you're describing this, it's like busy, busy, go, go, go. Oh, it never like, stopped. It was the, it never shut off. Yeah. The head <laughs> was a hundred miles per hour all day long, all the time. Yeah. Like in terms of even your day, the way that, you know, people, you're like, people were talking to me and da da da. And I kind of feel like the, the oh. way, like you're like leaving early, coming home late, probably like all of yes. these kinds of things. Yeah. And I would go to the gym at five in the morning. And then I would sprint home, I would shower, I would get my meal, everything set, and then I would sprint to work, and then I would work late nights because we had events, and then I would work weekends. So there was no time. There was, there was zero time. And so when I, um, and we, we can get to this part of the story, I guess, is when I was ready to leave my corporate career after my life-altering experience, after having my daughter, um, all I wanted, Tamara, was just to be present for my life and the people in it. But that was it. It was not oh, I want to go build this huge empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Achiever in me knew like we were going to do that. That was part of it. But it wasn't, it wasn't the central focus. It was always, and it still is, about being present for my, my aborning soul, for my growth, for my evolution, and, and the opportunity to get to do life with the amazing people that are in my life. That is, that's it. Like, that's what I'm here for, really, truly. And so like, for those who are listening who are in the busy right now, because there are so many people in the busy who are doing that and, and yeah. truly believe that 
and I'm saying this with love, you guys, that getting to the gym at 5 a.m. and you're doing self-care. That's your self-care, right? But it's continuously go, go, go. There's no downtime. There's no relaxing. There's no releasing. Yeah. I, I know we're going to get to the story, but like prior to yeah. the birth of your daughter, were you getting signs that there were like to slow down, like any yeah. breakdowns, things that yeah. were going on? But I was... Oh, I mean, all the time. I mean, I was taking Nexium. I had heartburn. I had stomach surgery in 2006. I had, uh, yeah, I mean, just so many things, you know, so many signs. Even doing the fitness competitions, my body would not lean out. It was holding on. It was just holding on for dear life. Also, I had endometriosis. And so I was getting injections every month or not every month, every couple months to not to suppress my period. So I was suppressing the most like natural part of myself. I was running away from my own, my, just myself, my spirit, my soul. Yeah. I did not, I, because I did not know how to do it any differently. I honestly didn't know how to do it any differently. And uh, I had beyond feathers, beyond bricks, right? I was like, how many Mack trucks do I need to wake up? Uh, but I didn't know how to do it differently. And I was terrified because the, the sort of, formation or the the structure of life and how it had to happen and what like success looked like none of it belonged to me it belonged to my projection and interpretation of what it needed to be for others in order for me to be worthy and loved and that was how i lived my life so yeah and even and this is a good segue into the to the birth story i went into early labor at 24 weeks I had this hellacious meeting with one of my, my colleagues where this person was swearing at me, F-bombing me, yelling at me in my office. I reached down to grab a, a onesie that someone, one of my coworkers had given me as a, like a baby shower gift. I pull this brand new pink little onesie out and I start wiping my tears and there's mascara all over it because I was wiping all of my tears and it's makeup, it's all over my, this, this brand new onesie for my baby sitting in my office. That was what I was using as a tissue. And I left that day and I was having contractions. And so I had to go to the hospital and they monitor me and they were like, everything's okay, but this isn't good. And I told them about what happened at work and they're like, and you don't need to be doing that. So you're going to be on modified bed rest, which means you can't go to work. You need to stay at home. And we don't even want you really working. And I was like, okay, this feels like a wrecking ball because I didn't know how to stop. And it was like torture for me to be at home, trapped in my house, pregnant, and feeling like I wasn't making any contributions to anything. And so like my whole orientation system, honestly, was like really around achievement through the eyes of other people. Yeah. I want to take a moment and explain to the listeners, because I use from you uh, the Feather yeah. Mac truck. And for those who are listening, who are like, what is she talking about? Can you yeah. just explain those three kind of things for everybody? Yeah. So it's like this analogy of thinking like life or God or, or spare the universe, whatever, insert your happy word here, as Karen Kenny always says, you insert your happy word, right? So the feather is the tap that you get from the universe. That's like, mm, this doesn't feel so good. This is, this is probably not the thing we should be doing. You know, it might be like a little fender bender or some sort of thing falling through or, you know, a client giving you weird vibes and you're like, mm, I probably shouldn't work with that person. I don't know. Like I, and when you're wanting to change the whole structure of your business, like it's like another person coming in. It's just a little feather tap. The next is the brick where you just get like smacked in the face with the, the proverbial brick, not a real one, a fake one, but you know, it could be that who knows what your, what your thing is. It's and it lays you out and it, and you just know like, this is a big old sign and then you ignore it. Right. So like raising my hand, cause I ignored so many of the bricks. And then what comes next is what we're using the word Mack truck, right? Like again, tongue in cheek, proverbial, you're not actually getting hit by Mack truck, but something significant that, that you, it changes the course of history for you. It changes your life in a dramatic way. And it forces your hand, essentially. It forces you to have to change when you had had the option to change before, but you chose not to because you were afraid. And now the Mack truck comes and it says, okay, I'm going to just plow you over now, sister. <laughs> yes. And believe me, guys, I can hear you, even though we haven't even uh -huh. yet. I can hear everybody kind of going like, okay, where am I? <laughs> like mm -hmm. what has happened in my, in my day, my life, my week, my month, my years? Have yeah. I seen the feathers, the bricks? Am I, you know, we never want to get to the Mack truck, guys. Like, no. If you can like pre, like be aware, 
get the awareness going, get the internal work going and avoid the Mack truck, that's, that's probably the best idea. Yeah. So why don't I tell my Mack truck story so that they, we have a really good example so that you guys can learn from my story and then maybe not have to have your own Mack truck moment. Let's, let's go there. It's yeah. Make me emotional too. So I'm going to try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So as you guys know, 24 weeks, I'm in early labor. I end up going to back to work the following week. Cause I was literally going to go crazy. And my husband's with me at the appointment and he's like, she might actually go into early labor because of her stress of not being at work. Like that's how lunatic status we've got going on here. He didn't say lunatic. I said that. So we, <laughs> I went back to work and uh, at that point, it was like the big signal to all of my colleagues that everybody needed to back up and just go easy on me because I needed space. And so it was actually this the first time I would say in my life that I gave myself the grace on being like, I can kind of just cruise here. You know, I already was the girl who was doing the slam dunks like with her behind her back at work, doing like a million people's jobs. And I was just kind of like, I got to ease out of this because I'm going to be on maternity leave anyway. So I need to stop being the overachiever because someone else needs to do that while I'm not here. So we get to um, full, full term the day before my due date. And I had already in my mind made up, my, made up the story that I wasn't going to have my child for another like two weeks or something, you know? And it's, it's the reason why is two part. One, for my whole life, my mom always told me this story that I was like, three weeks late or something like that. And how like torturous her 17 hour labor was. And I was just so late and it was so hard. Like she just tells that story like that. And so I just thought, man, well, first of all, like what a burden and pain in the ass I am. And then two, uh, first babies come really late. So like these two story, I had fully subscribed to those. And so I was like, well, my kid's not going to be coming for another like week and a half. Like she's definitely gonna be late. Like I was, this is hell. I just have to suffer through this like New Hampshire summers with no air conditioning where you work. God bless America. It was insane. Yeah. No air conditioning in my, in the field house where I worked. So I'm fully pregnant and walking into this like brick, you know, concrete building that was a thousand degrees. So, um, it's the day before it's seven 15 in the morning and I start having cramps and I'm like, I do, this is just to, to show you how disconnected I was. I didn't even understand what was happening. I'm, I'm just feeling awful, like the worst I've ever felt, like the worst period cramps of my entire life. And I'm texting my sister-in-law, who's an ER nurse, and asking her, you know, I feel really bad. You know, this is, this is really weird. What do you think's happening? And then she asked me, how far apart are your cramps, with her air quotes? And I said, uh, like five minutes. And she's like, okay, so you're in labor. And while I'm like going through all this, I'm emailing my boss and saying, I'm feeling a little crampy. I feel like, I, you know, I don't know. I think I'm okay, but I'll be in by noon. My, I had like a female boss too, where we could say that those words to each other and it would be normal. <laughs> so I told her I would be in by noon. You know, I'm like so disconnected. I'm in labor, like literally five minutes apart, already six centimeters that I found out when I get there. They, the doctor tells me to go straight to the hospital. I drive myself there because I'm not going to ask anybody else for help. I'm not asking a neighbor. I'm going to just, I got this drive myself to the hospital. I limp my way in there. They're like, do you need a chair? no, I'm good. I'm like grunting through contractions with my hands on the desk, signing the papers, get into the room. And within, you know, minutes we realize, yeah, you're being admitted. You're in labor. I'm at nine centimeters within an hour of that. And I'm, I pushed for like four hours. I was, I was like, if anybody's going to push a baby out today, it's this girl, right? I was, I was there. I was committed. I was in, I was ready. And, um, they said, well, your daughter's face up. So she's not turning and you now have a fever and her heart rate is high and we need to go do an emergency C-section because it's just, it's not like the worst of emergencies, but it's not a good situation and we need to get your daughter out safely. And I felt just incredible relief at that point because I was so exhausted and I had been throwing up for like the last hour, every 10 minutes and my whole body, my body was just shutting it down. So they bring me into the operating room. They, they, administer the spinal tap or the epidural and they lay me down on the table and within literal moments i can feel my lung volume just getting shorter and shorter and shorter and i'm realizing that i can't take a full deep breath and it's getting even harder and i'm now feeling like my breath is it's minuscule at this point and i notice at this, this moment that the nurse has now put a bag valve mask over my face and she's, her hand is pumping to the right of my face. 
and I can feel my lungs kind of inflating for me, but I'm not controlling it and I can't connect to my breath at all. And I am starting to panic. And it's funny because when I was a kid, I had um, exercise induced asthma and I would have asthma attacks on the field sometimes. And it, it felt just like this. And I remember saying to myself, Amber, just relax, don't panic. And I would say that when I was a kid to myself, don't panic, because if you panic and you start to cry, you will be able to breathe less. And that's when you get into real danger. And so I'm trying to relax. I whispered to the anesthesiologist, you're killing me. Because I believed that that was actually what was happening. And I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend the depth of what was happening in this moment. I heard the surgeon say to the anesthesiologist, how can I help? Now, we haven't even begun the surgery yet. And the surgeon's asking him how she can help because clearly something really bad is happening right now. And before I know it, I am, I am unconscious. I just kind of went into like this space of darkness, just black. And I'm not connected to whatever else was happening in the room at this point. And in that space between motherhood and what I now am computing to potentially be my death, I felt this overwhelming sense of just frustration and rage and regret because the first thing that I saw was what I was supposed to be doing, what I knew I wanted to do for my life. I saw myself speaking, writing books, like sharing my actual story, like sharing what I was born with, what I know, like my true gifts. It was like, I, I saw it. And I can't even describe what it looked like, but I just saw it. I felt the energy of my gifts and the realization that I wasn't going to get to share those with the world. And I think like that is actually the deepest loss that we can possibly have in life. And I was being met with it in the, the feeling it's like, I can feel it right now. It was, it was like the deepest kind of pain. And from there, it started to just kind of like lift and dissolve because now I could see my husband in the room where we had left him with his scrubs on and he was looking through the camera because he was trying to make sure it was perfect so he was ready to take pictures of his baby. And I could see my parents in the waiting room. And I could see my dad sitting down, also scrolling through his camera, my mom walking back and forth with her arms crossed, and she was so scared. I could just see her fear because it was her baby that was in there. And then I saw myself and I was met with this feeling, this warm feeling of just love and appreciation and this sensation of release that, and knowing that everything was going to be okay. Like this, this, deep knowing that was even deeper than the pain that I felt that everything was going to be okay. And that I, I was never afraid for Ani. I always knew she was going to be okay because she was coming in. <laughs> like she was, she's, she was coming in. She's work to do here. And I knew that I was the portal to help her physically get here and that she had the, the perfect dad and grandparents and family to support her no matter what. And so it was like the mom and me already ticked that box. And the next step really for me was just this letting go, like completely letting go and saying, you know, if this is, if this is my path, if this, and I said, and I remember saying, if this is your wish for me and my life, then I, then okay. And I just completely let go. And it was honestly within who knows what felt like milliseconds of me completely surrendering, opening my palms, just releasing all of my control, all of my grip. I was like a switch flipped and I was conscious and I was awake. And now all of a sudden the mask was off my face. I could breathe normally. The surgeon was standing on my left hip. The anesthesiologist was behind me and I heard him say, go, 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 go to her. And she started the procedure and Ani was born. And I remember looking over at her and just thinking, I didn't mess this up. She has all of her fingers. She has all of her toes. Like, like, oh my God, I didn't, like, I didn't mess this up. 
And it was this realization, like, you're not in control, Amber. Like, you don't have to control that. You don't have to control all these things. And so Ben came in and within moments and he got to hold her and I got to see her and, you know, nobody knew that this had happened for me, but I was a different person being wheeled out of that operating room. And it would take time for me to really, you know, get to this place. But, but I was changed, you know, I was different. And I, I remember just like looking at the world, like, well, you know, just differently because no one else was there. And the fascinating thing was that right after I got brought back into the room and they were tending, the nurses were tending to Ani and Ben and the anesthesiologist are standing at the, the foot of my bed. And I heard the anesthesiologist say to my husband, she could breathe the whole time, you know, she could breathe the whole time. And Ben said, okay. Cause he had no idea. He wasn't there. He didn't come into the room because I, I told them not to bring him in because I thought I was going to die. And I didn't want my husband's last vision of me to see me slipping away and him not being able to do anything about it. And Ben was just like, okay. And I didn't say anything, but inside I was, I was screaming and I'm saying, you're lying. That's not true. That is not true. And what I found out later was in this man's 20 year career, I was the first high spinal tap that he'd ever had. I needed a Mack truck to wake up. Through this story, Amber, thank you for sharing it because, well, it makes me super emotional because it took me through my, you know, the, the, the joy of birthing, right? Yeah. Yeah. At the same time. Um, but what a gift to receive. Not only a child. Yes. But the ability to trust. Yes. Mm -hmm. right like I could feel trust like wash through your body mm -hmm. yeah in that moment and it's something that so many people strive for and are still striving for that understanding that awareness of everything is going to be okay and mm -hmm. surrender yeah and in that moment you were graced it yes 100 percent it was like, I could feel like the whole experience of that and then Ani, and it was just mm -hmm. so powerful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's so many things that I can glean from it, but most of all, it was this knowing that this, if this is how we feel when we die, you know, if that's literally the experience, which I've done ample research on near-death experiences, I've heard many stories, and even the, the bird's eye view thing, it's all very consistent and the feeling changed, all very consistent and the, the complete feeling of release and just joy, you know, and just gratitude, appreciation, like love, like profound love that you cannot even put into words, just what that feeling was like. If that's what's there when we die, well, we have nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. And so why not? spend these precious days that we have in these physical bodies doing things that make us feel cl as close to that as possible love and joy and connection with each other and talking about what really lights us up and what really matters instead of this charade of feeling like you know we have to survive by being some other version than who we really are because you will not thrive as doing that you will not and there's no space for it. And it doesn't mean that, you know, if you're sitting in an office and you're not thriving, you're just surviving and you're getting it done. And the person next door is thriving because they love it because that is actually their true purpose that you're somehow wrong and, and they're right or vice versa. It's, it's about knowing yourself intimately enough and committing to that work so that you can create the life experience that you truly want to live. That's going to help you share the depth of yourself, the most magical parts of yourself with the world. I love this. Have I ever told you what I, my, I, I, cause I have this conversation cause death, when you get to a space of alignment with source, there is no death. It's just experience correct itself, Right. Yes. And so, you know, the conversations that we can have with our kids and our, and our partners and things, have I ever told you what I actually call my, my funeral? No, I would love to. I, I call it my rebirth day. Oh yeah. Right. 
I love it. So like, that's how, and like, that's the communication that I have with my family regarding this. And yes, maybe I get a little insane and say that I want a pinata and, you know, <laughs> goodie bags on my rebirth day, but whatever. <laughs> because hey, to each her own. I mean, I want people to have a big old shindig here at the lake and enjoy and go swimming and, you know, yeah. like put, put me in a, plant me in the, the earth. Sprinkle that's what I want to Yes. Like, let's just, you know, dust to dust, get me back, get me back where I came from, you know? And I just don't take this, this whole physical body thing so seriously. And, and I think that, like that, helps us to recognize that, oh, our bodies are just, they're, they're just the, they're like the little puppet, you know, that like gets to have the physical experiences and to like feel the sensations more deeply and like eat the chocolate and all that, you know? But it's, but it's, it's not who I am. I am not this body. Now getting back into like, cause I love this conversation. Now I just want to go like, and, yeah. and, and, right? because, yeah. <laughs> because you explained like coming out of the hospital and feeling different and seeing the world differently. But yes, from, that was about four years ago, correct? Uh, five, uh, 2013, five, five. So from yeah. then until being in this expanded, like centered, grounded, mm-hmm. like world, true, actual me, <laughs> yeah, human, yeah. Like, experience self, like what did, what were the things you did to fully expand into this self? Yeah. Um, the, it started with permission because I really needed a lot because I felt like everybody else had, was holding the permission slips for me and signing them for me, you know? Like that, that even when I went to college, it's so funny. I was 17. I'm, I'm one of the younger ones in my, my like school years, you know, and I'm at preseason at college and I'm having to have my parents like fax sign things for me. I'm the only one on the whole team because I'm the 17 year old, you know, and just even those like little, those little themes of like, I need to ask permission. Like I can't, can't sign something on my behalf when I live alone at college, right. For a couple of weeks until I'm 18. And so it was really about giving myself permission to simply want what I wanted. I did not know how to do that. It was all about the, the rigor. It was the rules. And again, I didn't say this earlier and I meant to, so I'm going to say it now. I was a division one athlete. In order to do that, there, you have to learn how to overcome pain. You have to train yourself to push through the, the pain receptors of your body because you do not have time and space. And that's what actually helps you to get better. You're pushing yourself past pain, you know, when you cannot breathe on the field and you're, it's the last minute of the game and you have to score the goal. Like it, I learned that I was, a, I was really good at that. Mm-hmm. So when I got out into the real world, into real life, I mean, it wasn't something I was ever taught. My parents were both athletes. We all were athletes. My brother was the, the Big East champion of pole vaulting and was the captain of the Yukon Huskies track team. Like that's, that's us, you know, that's our family. And so we bring that push through the pain, toughness kind of thing to all aspects of life. And on the other side of, of Ani's birth, well, I had incredible complications. So I had um, abscesses and my ileus, my stomach stopped working. I had um, just a lot of things. And I was in the hospital for a week and it was very, very difficult. There were days where I was laying in the bed and I remember Ani was in the, the crib and I couldn't I physically couldn't even sit up to get to her. I needed to ring someone to come help me because Ben went home to feed the dogs. You know, like that was what my reality was. And so um, my body basically was like, nope, we're, we can't do that. And this is going to take a long time. You know, like this healing process is going to take a long time. And we're not just jumping back on the horse. And I also didn't want to. You know, I was mentally ready now because my whole orientation of the world like shifted on its axis. And now I'm also a mom. And so like everything that impacts me impacts her. And it was a package deal. So I wasn't willing to be an asshole to myself anymore. You know, I just, it's like, there's no time or space for that. And I did that deep work. And I'm so grateful that I did because that was not going to work here as a mom. And so I had those three and a half months. And honestly, Tamara, it was the first time in my entire life that I was not working in pursuit of something. I took those three months off. And I was just off. I couldn't work and I didn't want to. It was the first time I didn't actually care. I was like, I don't, don't email me. I don't want anything to do with this. I am here with my child and I'm healing. And that is all I wanted to do. And so it was the first time I gave myself a real break. And so I got to see what that actually looked like. I had never stopped. I was always training. I was training for, for soccer. And then I was training to be on a semi-professional team after college. Then I was training after surgeries to heal, to get back on the field, you know? And so I had now an opportunity to learn. And um, I think, you know, there was this one profound conversation 
that my friend um, from high school and I were having one day. And she said, I remember she said this to me on the phone. She, we got to this point where I was crying and I was like, I just don't know what to do. I have to go back to work, but I don't want to, but I have to, and I'm not sure how I'm going to change. My, and I was just like falling apart. And she said, Amber, this is your life. And she said it just like that. And, she, and the word life just reverberated in the air. And I could like feel it in my bones. And I realized you're right. This is my life. What am I doing? What am I doing with it? I have so much more I want to do here. Sorry, UPS man just came. Um, <laughs> and and it, was the, it was the trajectory. It was like that moment when I went back to work and I'm sitting at work and I'm realizing that like, I don't fit here anymore. This puzzle piece no longer belongs to this puzzle that I needed to make a change. And so this was December. So I had Ani in August of 2013, December of 2013. I wrote the letter to my future self and I wrote it in technicolor detail of what my life was going to be like and how grateful for that transformation I was for how grateful I was to myself for committing to that transformation. And I outlined the whole thing about like your business and your home with Ani and you're serving women, you're helping them in a profound way. And, and also like, I didn't know how I was going to do that. <laughs> I just was like making it up. I'm just writing it. You're, you're going to be like, you know, just debt free. Like I had the whole thing all mapped out. And fast forward to March of 2014, I joined an online program. I connected with entrepreneurs, people who were actually doing the thing that I wanted to do and getting into their space and into their sphere and started making relationships and connections with them. I started working with a coach and achiever. I just almost gonna say overachiever achiever, uh, just started doing it, you know, and, and was having a blast of building the website. You know, I'm bleary eyed at night in between feedings, My husband's a police officer working nights. And I just started working at it. But the, the fulfillment that I felt from doing that work was so profoundly different than what my job was feeling like at that season of my life. Um, and so in May of 2014, I gave my notice and I had one client when I gave my notice a couple of weeks before that. And then I left, I walked away, I drove down the hill, I put my little name tag and my stuff in the box, and I drove, and I just never forget it, driving down that hill. It was the most free I had ever felt in my life. It was like, I don't, nobody owns me. Nothing, nobody owns me, I can just do whatever I want. And, and at this point I had like really started to lean into my confidence and this knowing that, you know, Look at what I was able to create over these last 10 years, working all of those hours. I know I'm not going to work all those hours, but if I can commit to just the thing I want to create, I can create some magic here. And I, and it was like my, everything had shifted, you know, and, and as far as the spiritual practices and all those things, um, it's just been like turning up rocks and following the breadcrumbs and finding the magical people along the way who have been become dear friends and then spiritual mentors and helpers and healers and everything in between. And it's just been like this perfect little path that's led me to just, again, living more into the truth of who I really am every single day. I mean, I think that's what it is. It's just like a peeling back the veils, peeling back the layers every day so that I can just show up as me now and I don't have to alter it in any way, shape or form. So I have a fun question. Um, cause again, I watch Amber, she's my coach, like check her out on Insta stories and things like that. And so I watched you open a letter that you and Ben had written from last December. Is this something that you've always done? Like how long have you been writing December letters for? Since 2013. So that was the, that, that was, was the, the time when it started. I it, got it. I'm holding it right now, people. You can hear it in my hand. This is the one from last year, 2017. And it's so fun. It's just the most, it's the coolest thing because you just get in this portal. I mean, I love New Year's Eve. It's my mom's birthday too, which is also a wild little detail. She doesn't like that that's her birthday, but um, she's like, oh, my birthday is such an afterthought, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, mom, well, we'll just celebrate on the first. So it can be, the day can be all about you. How about that? <laughs> and she likes that, you know, it's good. She doesn't like doing things late at night and all that. So, so I love that. Like people are, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? I'm like sitting on my couch, lighting candles, eating snacks, and writing letters to our future selves and like doing a year in review, going through our phones, looking at all the pictures from the last year, because it just shows you all the places you've been and all the things you've done. And you can just walk down memory lane and we cry and we laugh and 
it's just the most beautiful, beautiful thing. And you wake up the next morning just being like, wow, it's like a fresh new ski slope of 2019 of the new year. I think this is really, really powerful. You don't know this, but this is actually going to go live before New Year's of 2000. Oh, yay! Yeah, people are going to be able to hear this and like, yes. like even practice this themselves because I watched you do that. And I love scripting like future self statements and things totally. like that. Totally. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's powerful because this is like an order to the universe of what you would like. So you're basically, I always call it like the universal drive through. You're rolling down the crown chakra and you're like, hey, universe, mm-hmm. these are the things that I would like. And I, I think that that's such a powerful intention mm-hmm. to be setting prior yeah. to the beginning the next year. And we also reset all of our passwords to align with the goals that we want to welcome into. So our just, you know, your Apple, your iTunes password and your email password into something that is like what you're wanting to welcome in. And it's so funny because the other day I was like, what is that password? It was one on something that was like from a year and a half ago. And I'm like, man, that was a small goal. Like, let's change that up. Like, man, we crushed that. (laughs) What's really cool too, is that somebody else had mentioned to me about passwords recently and I started to change my password. So now that's the second time that I've heard that. Now I might just, but like I've been changing a couple of my passwords as it come up to my, like what it is that I want to call in as well. So guys, Mm -hmm. If I'm telling you Amber's bringing it up, it's a thing. It's, it's a, a thing. thing. Just saying. Do it. Write a letter to your future self as if all of the things that you want to have happen in the next year happened. And you're giving gratitude for all of those things, those experiences, those encounters. Whatever. I mean, I even had on this, and this is from last year, I had, um, because our cat Ozzy is 17 years old, I was like, Ozzy's doing great. And you and, and the other pets are thriving. Like, I literally wrote that down. And guess what? They're doing great. And so it's just like, you know, and for me, last year's letter was all about my mindset. It was all about my, my loving of myself. It really was. And then, yeah, they were like, okay, build the dream house that was on there. And I can't even believe like that because I didn't, that version of me when I was writing that was like, I don't know, that seems like a little bit of a stretch, but we'll just put on the next one if we have to. Right. And it, and it happened. So powerful shite. Yeah. The letter, the letter works guys. The letter works. So have you already like kind of started to think about what you're going to be writing for this year's letter? Yeah. Or do you- oh yeah. yeah. I already got it. No, I, I, I think about it a lot. Cause I'm always thinking about what's, what's next because what's next is what's now. Tim story says that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm already, you know, calling in the downloads, the, the synchronicity, the connections to give birth to those things, but I'm not doing it in a way like the old versions of me did that were like a little bit longing, a little strivy, a little grippy. I'm just in the like, Ooh, this will be so fun. Like, let's let this, let's see how this is going to unfold. You know, like, Oh, I know this is happening next year and I don't know how, but I'm, I, I can't wait to see. So quick question here, just a, like a random kind of like, I have my like final question, but this one is like, because I know that there's a lot of overachievers and people like that, your top three, the top three ways that you detach from that Mm. mentality or being drawn back into that? Yeah. Good question. Um, I think breath, (laughs) breathing and really finding my feet in the present moment, being where my feet are. I think that's like coming back to the present always. Um, two, how do I say this? Uh, I have to detach from someone else's version of success or from someone else's, you know, like Instagram feed version of their life. Right. And so, um, I think that that then gives me the invitation to stand really firmly planted in what I'm creating and what I'm growing and celebrate, you know, that because my life's awesome. And what I, and so it's like really, again, like this self reverence, the self-reflection and recognizing that, you know, I can create something that's great. And so can Tamara and they don't have to compete with each other. They just co-create together and so magical. Right. So it's like standing in the knowing of what, what belongs to me. Um, and then the third would be just paying attention to my patterns and, and, you know, committing to that daily spiritual practice. I mean, that's, that goes without saying, if I don't close my eyes and get, get in there and go inward every single day, for even like, even if it can only be five to 10 minutes, then I'm just all wonked out. You know, it's, it's, I'm just, I have an edge to me and it's not the edge that I want to be leading with in my life. And so that practice of just connecting back to the infinite part of myself, again, I also do it like all day, all the time. You know, when I go for those nature walks in the middle of the day, 
I'm not going to get exercise. I'm going to talk to God. Mm-hmm. I'm going to connect to myself. I'm, I'm, you know, like I put on instrumental music because I don't want to hear someone else's words. I just want to hear spirits words as they come through. So, so yeah. So I think that that last part is just really committing to that spiritual practice and, um, and to what is true for you. Yes. Thank you for the Spotify um, playlist because I've already tapped into it today. After it's good, right? It was so good. It yeah. was like, what was the name of it too? It was it's called like, Walking with God. It's, it's one, God. That's, that's why I, the one I put on when I go walking with God. Yeah. <laughs> In my woods. <laughs> so I totally appreciate everything that you're saying because it is so important that everybody understands these concepts and, and these practices because it is the essence of our very soul's calling of mm-hmm. who we are and what we are on this earth to do. And I'm so grateful to you for holding the sacred container for me to expand into that version of myself. And it makes me so emotional. You make me cry just like I make others cry. It's really powerful. Mm-hmm. And I, I just love you, which, love you. Mm-hmm. you know, you know that through and through. And I would love to share more information about you. Is there a specific place people can go to just be in your light that we can yeah. send them to? Thank you. Well, I love you and it's an honor to get to walk this path with you and to get to hold space for you and your profound gifts. And you guys, if you're listening to this and you have a nudge to reach out to Tamara to check out her programs, to work with her intimately, stop waiting because she's just going to make it so much easier for you on your path. She's just going to help you, you know, not have to go through these brick and Mack truck moments and, and just honestly, you know, be affirmed in what is real for you. And I just think we need that. You know, it's like the reason why I was able to do that on my path is because I did have people holding space. I had my therapist, you know, I had my coach and they, they were the game changers in my life. And I still have, I have multiple coaches. I have a trainer. I have people who hold space for me so that I can hold space for others. So if you guys got to assemble your dream teams in order to get to the next level. So I just needed to say that. Um, to connect with me, you can just head over to amberliliestrom.com. Uh, I also have a podcast called The Amber Liliestrom Show that Tamara has been on. So listen to that. And um, I'm on Instagram. I love doing weird, funny stories because I'm just totally weird. Just like Tamara, we love being weird. It's the best. Ani and I have a song where we say, why be normal? Just be weird, 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 weird. <laughs> We sing it. It's a song. It's gonna be so catchy. I'm gonna be singing it all day now. I know. Sorry, guys. Earworm. Um, it's our own original uh, production that we've created in the backseat of the car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then the other thing I have to talk about, and Tamara will be there dancing in the crowd. You guys just sitting in the front row at the Ignite Your Soul Summit in 2017. Uh, excuse me, 2019. Let's go back in time. What? The 27th and the 28th of April in 2019, you can go to igniteyoursoulsummit.com to get a ticket. And since this is going live before the end of 2018, you can get two tickets for the price of one up until the 31st. So and I can't stress enough, guys, how much you want to be in that room. You have to be there. All that are going to be there is insane. 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 We've already, we're already halfway there to the sellout. We're going to have 500 people in the room. It's going to be a life changer in every single way. It's like, it is, it is magic. And it's still like kind of the best kept secret. So I kind of love like the 500 people that are, that like get there are going to have an experience that in the future is just not going to be possible because it's just going to keep growing, you know, and this year it's going to be off the chain. Right. And celebrate the intimacy of that. You guys, like like, that's what we're trying to say here is like, this is the moment where you get to be in a small. Yeah. Where we're like hugging and taking pictures and like getting to like see each other. So it's, yeah, it, oh my God. It's whenever I think people say, what are you excited for 2019? I'm like the summit. I literally last night had a dream about one of my favorite songs that I've been visualizing. I visualize every day dancing on stage to it. And it was in my dream last night and it was the best. So I can't wait to just share all the magic that is that weekend with you guys. I'm going to be totally thinking about when you're dancing on stage, which song that was from the <laughs> I'll be like, is that the one? It feels like that one. <laughs> and my favorite question to ask, um, and something moving forward is going to grow into something really powerful, but I love to ask, as you know, I'm the hugest bookworm in the land, read first thing in the morning, last thing before bed. I even have like bath books that stay beside the tub. Like love. what is, and you can, one book, like the one book that has okay. most oh, okay. impact one. in your life. In my life. <sighs> I know it's such a hard question. God, there's so many. But I think the one that I, um, that is most 
treasured and cherished to me is Mark Nepo's The Book of Awakening. It is so sacred to me. And it is like water's been spilled on it. And I've written all over it and dog-eared basically every freaking page. Um, he is my favorite author. I'm reading another one of his books called 7,000 Ways to Listen right now. And it's cracking me open. Um, but The Book of Awakening, it's, it's just so powerful. So I'm going to go with that one. Cool. And I just ordered it on Amazon. It oh, be- yay. Okay. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Like, literally, it like, takes my breath away. Like, when somebody, you know that feeling when somebody hasn't been to an event or they haven't listened to a song or, and then they're, they're going to, and you, they're like, you get to be the witness to them. Like, my friend never listened to Brandy Carlyle before. And I was like, what? Oh, my God. I cannot breathe right now. What are you talking about? I'm like, okay, I'm just going to watch you while you listen to her songs, like a total weirdo. And, and now she's like literally dying and obsessed and it's that feeling. So I cannot wait for you to, to send me a message when you start diving. Well, which is funny because I was at chapters the other day, which is like our friends and noble. And I picked it up and I opened it and I was like, whoa, this is yeah. intense, right? This is an experience. The shelf, and then I came home and I was like, no, because I always love the resistance I feel to things. It's a, it's like a clear indicator of a hard yes. So I could feel I that like form of resistance to the book. So I was like, you need this book. You need it. I was, I'm reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Yes. And I got to a place of discomfort in the book. I wrote about this in my last email where I was just like, you don't need this book. This is, you know, you're further along than this, which guys, we never are further along than anything. No, no. And then of course I had to get through that resistance and the book is transform it like yeah it's amazing so amazing yeah right yeah um but thank you oh so much for being here i just wish i could squeeze you right now in gratitude mm-hmm. for how much me too i'm gonna say one other quick thing april 22nd in the book of awakening it's my favorite passage in the whole book I'm just gonna Is drop it dated that it's dated oh so it's like a daily practice mm-hmm. <gasps> yeah oh so fun. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So April 22nd, just going to throw that out there. And this is just to show you the level of my geekdom. He's <laughs> on the super soul Sunday interview with Oprah and I'm listening on the plane and he's talking about a story of his life of when he was dealing with cancer. And I literally, I, this, the story is from April 22nd and I'm like, April 22nd, April 22nd, like a total nut on the plane. Like that's what he's talking about. I'm such a super fan. And I'm also going to have you guys all hold the space for me. We have an invitation out that has been like tentatively confirmed that Mark Nebo is going to be on my podcast. <gasps> mm, holding so much. That's how they call that in. That's a- I'm like, I don't need anything else to happen in 2019. I'll just be like laying on the floor, like completely dead if that happens. So <laughs> I cannot oh, wait. So exciting. Yeah. I'm so excited yeah. for you. And like I said, whew. Yeah, in call the, it in. In the vortex. Oh. <laughs> in the vortex. It's so good. All right, sister, I love you. And I guys, you you follow her, Amber, on Insta Stories and be at the summit and, you know, be in the energy of people who raise your vibration as high as you possibly can so that you can shine like the supernova that you are. And Amber is one of those people. Love you, sister. Love you too. Thank you.